llevado a cabo numerosos estudios comparativos sobre la organización y la financiación de los sistemas de atención a la dependencia. Ella dirige también el programa de investigación del Departamento de Salud Británico sobre elección y cambio a lo largo del ciclo vital. Eh, participó como coordinadora en la evaluación de los proyectos pilotos sobre fondos individuales de atención en Inglaterra. Y recientemente su investigación se ha centrado en los servicios de recapacitación a domicilio. En la ponencia que nos presenta hoy nos va a ofrecer una visión crítica de las reformas que se han llevado a cabo en Inglaterra de cara a promover la autodeterminación de las personas usuarias y a mejorar la eficiencia del sistema de cuidados a la dependencia. Como digo, es un placer, con nosotros tener, eh, es un placer para nosotros tener a una investigadora de la talla de Caroline y nada, os dejo en sus manos. No quieras. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. I don't know what you said, but thank you for the introduction. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is first of all say a little bit about how uh, social services are organized in England. And I want to emphasize I'm talking about England only, not Great Britain, because social services are the responsibility of the devolved governments of England, Scotland, Ireland uh, and Wales. So I'm only talking about England, not the rest of Great Britain. I'm going to talk about one of the major developments that's taken place in social services over the last 20 years, which is the development of markets and um, how that has then extended into the development of a market in which individual service users um, have, are supposed to have control over the funds for their services. And I'm going to talk a bit about the research that we've done that's looked at the evidence on the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of giving people control over their own resources. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other measures that have um, been introduced over the last 10 years particularly to try and improve efficiency. And then I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about some of the things that haven't happened and the major, major gaps, uh, particularly around funding and sustainable funding and the difficulties of achieving reform um, of social services funding. So, England, um, there is a really clear division between responsibilities for health and responsibilities for social services, social care. So health is the responsibility of a national health service, which is centrally managed. It is funded from national taxation, and it is mainly free of charge. Social services are the responsibility of local authorities, local municipalities. Um, there is limited autonomy for um, local authorities over their provision of services. They are tightly regulated and controlled uh, by central government. But one of the consequences of that local autonomy and the tradition of local autonomy for social services is that there are very substantial local variations um, and variations between individual local authorities um, in the levels of services and the types of services they provide and indeed variations in eligibility, um, the levels of the threshold uh, that is used to determine eligibility for social services. Social services are social care services are funded from national and local taxation and there is very substantial contributions of charges by co-payments uh, by service users themselves. And over the last um, 10 years in particular, um, eligibility thresholds have risen. So that increasingly fewer people are eligible for services and these are the people who have the most intensive needs and receive very intensive services. Um, and the other point I'd make is that there are other uh, funds for specific um, 
things relate, items related to social services like equipment, uh, support that's linked to housing provision and so on. So we have a, si a system that is very fragmented between health, social services and other sort of local and national funds for specific purposes. I said that one of the biggest changes that's taken place over the last 20 years has been the introduction of markets into social services. Until 1993, uh, local authorities generally um, provided, funded and provided social services themselves. But from 1993 onwards, um, local authorities were encouraged to divide their activities into purchasing and provision and increasingly to purchase services not from their own um, in-house providers but to purchase services from an external market of private, charitable and for-profit providers. And this has really transformed the landscape of social care so that in 1990 only 2% um, of home care services uh, were provided by the independent sector. It's now well over 80%. So a big increase, enormous transformation of provision from uh, services provided by local authorities to services provided by the uh, purchased from the charitable and uh, for-profit sectors. Responding to demands from dis younger disabled people, in 1997 um, there was a, a legislation to introduce a cash payment as an alternative to service provision. Um, it was a voluntary scheme and the money was generally used by younger disabled people to employ a personal assistant. But it, I, I will come on to say that um, there was very limited, a very variable take-up of this option. So in 2006, um, the government uh, announced the piloting of a programme of personal budgets. And I will say a lot more about this. Uh, in a minute. Um, so the pilot program ran for two years and we are now in a period where personal budgets are being offered to all individuals, to all, everybody who is eligible for um, social services. And the principle underpinning personal budgets is that choice and control over the resources that are available to you to fund your care, that choice and control is devolved down to the individual. So you can see the way in which the market has gradually developed from um, buying services from uh, the, the local authority buying services down to the individual buying services. That's the expectation. So the principles underpinning personal budgets are to try and enhance uh, choice and control by service users. And there's an interesting um, alignment, a synergy between um, consumerism, market-led consumerism, and the claims and uh, demands of younger disabled people for greater control over their resources. Um, the principle is that an individual has an allocated amount of money that is available to them, uh, that they should know how much, that money is, how much money is available to them before they start planning services and planning what services they need, and that you identi should identify what you want, what are the important things in your life, and how you best want to meet them, you can uh, use your money to buy anything that is legal and safe, and that will include um, mainstream services. So instead of having a service that brings a meal, or meal to your home, uh, you might choose to spend the money on going out to a local cafe uh, to have a meal. It can also include paying friends and relatives 
uh, for providing care. You don't have to have the money as a cash payment. That is one option. Um, it is very common for the money to be held by the local authority and managed by a care manager. And that is particularly common for older people. Many older people do not want, um, apparently want the cash payment and the money is given to the local authority to manage. And a, another option is for the money to be given to a service provider um, and then you just ask for the services as and when you need them. Uh, the money can be managed by a third party, an organisation, um, a user-led organisation, or it can be managed by a carer on your behalf. Or you can have any combination of those. Um, the plan for how you're going to spend your budget is approved by the local authority, and the local authorities will look at any risks that might be involved, any risks to the personal safety of the individual, any risks, for example, of, of financial abuse occurring. And there is supposed to be a regular review of how you've spent your, um, your, your money and whether, in fact, you are doing the best you can with the resources that have been given to you. Now, those are the principles underpinning personal budgets. I have to say that it's increasingly clear that it doesn't always work like that, uh, but those are the principles um, that local authorities and individuals, disabled and older people, are working to. We, I said that the personal budgets were piloted there was a, um, a pilot program uh, for two years, and I will say, sorry, say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, the whole principle of giving people cash and giving people cash to control and manage themselves has had only limited effectiveness. So I said earlier that from 1997, there, there was an option for people to receive a cash payment instead of services, the value of the services. That had um, very low take-up overall. There were major variations between local authorities um, in the numbers of people who took up this option. And there were also big variations between different groups of users of social care. So it was very popular amongst working age adults with physical disabilities. It was least popular amongst older people and people with mental health problems who appeared not to want to take this cash option and manage the payment themselves. There was quite a lot of research conducted on uh, the a direct payment option, but they tended to be very small-scale studies. They were studies of people who'd used this service, used, taken this option, and had found that it had transformed their lives. They were empowered, they were able to do things that they wanted to, they were able to lead the lives they wanted to do, they were able to do things that s traditional services did not <coughs> allow them to do. Things like employment, having a social life, um, undertaking training, education, and so on. But they were, so there were a lot of, of stories of good news stories about how the, the, the cash option, the direct payment option, had the potential <coughs> to transform people's lives. But there, was very, there were very small scale studies, and they tended to concentrate on the successes. So when the personal budgets were piloted in 2006, um, there was a major opportunity there um, to undertake a really rigorous evaluation of this pilot program. And we were actually able to conduct a randomized controlled trial where we had a group of people who were randomized into taking the personal budget um, and we had a comparison group of people who continued to receive standard traditional services. So we were able to do a really rigorous comparison between those two groups. And we compared them on a range of outcome measures to do with quality of life. Overall, 
there was no significant difference in the outcomes between the two groups. But there were some major variations um, within uh, the two groups. So when we looked at people with mental health problems, people who had personal budgets had much better quality of life. People with physical and sensory disabilities, again, again people with personal budgets reported that they were much more satisfied uh, with their lives and with the care that they received. Uh, overall, the people with personal budgets had higher scores on a, a, a measure of control over their daily lives, but older people did not do as well. People, older people with a personal budget actually had lower psychological well-being scores than people who'd had conventional services. So a very mixed picture in terms of outcomes from that personal budget um, pilot experiment. We also looked at whether or not personal budgets were cost effective. In relation to social, a range of outcomes to do with social care, and a particular outcome measure that has been developed to, to look at social care outcomes, there was some evidence of cost effectiveness overall. There was much weaker evidence of cost effectiveness in relation to psychological well-being. But again, there were significant variations between different groups. So the evidence of cost effectiveness was much higher uh, for people of working age with physical disabilities and people with mental health problems. But again, there was no evidence that this was a cost-effective uh, intervention for older people. And there are a number of possible reasons for that. Older people tend to come into the social services system when they are very frail, um, often as a result of a crisis, perhaps they've had a fall or they've been in hospital, they find it very difficult to anticipate what their needs are going to be. Their health is probably declining and they may experience repeated health crises. Um, increasingly, they have, older people have quite significant levels of cognitive impairment that make it, may make it difficult to plan and think ahead about what your needs might be. And if you're in a lot of pain um, and you know your health is not very good, quite simply you don't want the hassle, you don't want the, the responsibility of having to manage and organise your own support. So that's a, a number of possible reasons why um, you know, the, those lower scores um, and worse outcomes for older people. There are a number of other issues that arose from this um, big trial that we did. Um, I said that older people, the outcomes were worse for older people. Um, they tend, their budgets tended to be much smaller than those of working age people. Quite simply, they had le less flexibility, less freedom of choice, less scope to do creative and imaginative things. Um, most of their budgets were spent on personal care, which was absolutely essential. They needed that, and once the personal care needs were met, there was not a lot of money left over to do um, other creative things. Personal budgets did have a, a positive impact on family carers, and we did, a, we did a study, a linked study, where we compared the carers of people with personal budgets with the carers of people in the comparison group who'd had conventional services. And the carers of people with a personal budget, um, they, they had much better outcomes. And there was some evidence that personal budgets may well be cost effective for carers. Implementing personal budgets had major implications for social services staff, and particularly people who worked as care managers, doing assessments and managing care for, for, for people. Um, they had to move from 
a much more kind of prescriptive approach where um, they thought they knew what was best for people um, to a, an approach where they had to concentrate and focus on the individual service user and start with what the service user wanted for their lives. They also had to de work within a, um, a situation in which they had to be careful about risk. And social services professionals are traditionally, conventionally quite risk averse. Um, and this was quite a problem for some uh, professionals in, tr in letting go uh, of the control and letting service users take risks uh, with their lives and with their money. There are major implications for the social care market. And I talked earlier about how the market has been transformed into um, a very extensive network of private, charitable and for-profit providers. Now, most of those providers have developed with, in, in a context in which local authorities were large bulk purchases of services. And with personal budgets, that purchasing market is being broken up with more individuals becoming individual purchasers. And one of the consequences of that is that for providers, they, uh, they, you lose the economies of scale that come with large bulk uh, purchasing arrangements. People with personal budgets did start to ask for uh, a more diverse range of services so as well as personal care, which was the bulk of um, the, the services provided, uh, people started to ask for help with gardening, with shopping, with looking after their pets, taking their dogs for a walk. Um, and people also started to ask for more, wanted more flexibility, rather than having a visit from a home carer every day uh, for half an hour. They'd say, well, I'd like to save up some of my time and have a big uh, visit at the weekend so I can be taken out and go and visit my family or I can have somebody accompany me to the shops. So they wanted more flexibility over how their time was used and that created pressures for service providers who had to manage quite tight staff rotors. Um, there were increases in transaction costs because instead of just billing the local authority for a bulk purchase of services, Individuals had to be billed, have to be billed for, their, uh, for the, the, the services that they've bought. And it also increases providers to new financial risks as well because those individuals may not pay their bills on time. Um, they may die um, and uh, leave bills unpaid. Um, and the whole purchaser market is, becomes much less stable as far as providers are concerned. Despite all of that, and all of those kind of um, less than positive um, results from the personal budget uh, pilot, it has not stopped the English government from extending personal budgets, as I said, to everybody. And now, um, and up till um, this year, there's been a program of making sure that whenever a new person comes to social services, they are offered a personal budget. It is now compulsory, okay? So personal budgets for everybody. There have been some other measures to try and improve efficiency. I talked earlier about this kind of division between the National Health Service, which provides health and uh, social care, social services managed by local authorities. There's been a very long-standing um, imperative to try and improve collaboration between those two sectors. Um, there have, over the years, been some successes. Probably the biggest success was movement in the 1980s, um, whereby people with learning disabilities and mental health problems were moved from long-stay hospitals into some much smaller living arrangements in the community. But more recently, there have been um, some successes with joint 
service developments, particularly to support, support people when they discharge from hospital. That transition from hospital discharge back home and supporting people in the community. And important part of that has been pressure to discharge people earlier. And the earlier you discharge people from hospital, the more important it is to make sure that there is adequate support for them in the community when they're at home. Um, and there's been particular success in relation to mental health services, and many mental health services now are integrated, uh, integrate both the, the medical, nursing, and social care elements of services. So there have been some successes. Okay. Um, and, and, and part of that has been the another, another area where there's been quite a lot of development um, and attempts to improve efficiency is around this kind of rehabilitation and reablement for people when they're discharged from hospital. Um, so most areas now have, again, joint funded services, jointly managed services um, to support people when they're discharged from hospital or prevent them being admitted to hospital they tend to be short-term and free of charge, and there is some evidence that the services will reduce or delay uh, demand for health and social care. But there are some much bigger questions, and I just want to spend the last five minutes yeah. concentrating on these bigger issues that are not being addressed. So we still have a structural fragmentation between local authorities, the National Health Service, we have social security benefits for disability, we have services and benefits for family carers. What I've given you is a very sort of small picture of a very broad and fragmented range of services and provisions. Eligibility for social care, social services depends on numerous different criteria. Uh, depending on which of those bits of the system you're trying to get into. So there are tests of your income, tests of your assets, your wealth. There are tests of your health needs, your capacity for self-care, the risk of harm, and particularly important, how much help you get from family carers. And some or all of those eligibility criteria are applied at different points along that, you know, depending on which of those um, sort of services you're trying to access, some or all of those, some of those different eligibility criteria will be applied. But at a local level, there really is, it's called a postcode lottery. It is entirely dependent on where you live, uh, as to what services and what level of support you'll get. And uh, figures from, um, for example, boroughs in London, different local authorities within the London area, um, there are huge variations in the amount of money, the average amount of money that is spent on social care services for an individual. There is a long-standing problem about the underfunding of social care. It's estimated that at the moment there's about 800 million euros uh, funding gap each year between demand and what is actually available. Um, social care has been severely hit by the UK government's um, deficit reduction strategy. There is a very extensive private market because of the high eligibility criteria, eligibility thresholds for publicly funded care. So there's a very extensive private market. People just aren't eligible for services and buy their services privately. There's very extensive reliance on families to provide care and that is becoming increasingly unsustainable. Carers organisations predict that over the next 20 years the supply of family care will increase by 13%, but demand will increase by 55%. And by 2017, there'll be a tipping point where demand um, can far, begins to outstrip the care that families can provide. So the reliance on families is not sustainable. 
and the overall figures about sustainability are that there will be up to 13.9 billion euros extra needed by 2025 just to maintain services at their current levels and those levels are already very um, inadequate. I'm going to leave that slide out and just emphasise again this real, sum, summarise what I think the major problems are, which are long-standing un, underfunding this is not a short-term crisis issue. This is a very, very long-term failure to fund social care services adequately. Over the last 20 years, there's been an enormous increase, um, a big increase in funding that's gone into health, but it has not been matched by the funding um, into social services. So there is very considerable, long-standing, long-term unmet need, and that is exacerbated by um, the anticipated demographic pressures, um, the increase in the numbers of older people, and also the increase in younger people who now survive into adulthood with very, very complex and severe disabilities. So there's huge um, pre de demographic pressures and, of course, all of those are made worse by the current um, sort of fiscal austerity. There is a basic lack of any sense of right or entitlement to social care services. There is an absolute cut-off for people um, who have assets that be the above €29,000. And there are very big local variations. And certainly older people's organisations um, are particularly concerned about these local variations, the lack of consistency um, between local authorities in the services that are available. Big barriers to reform, um, the difficult, and I think this is something that I, I would be very interested in discussing more, but very um, clearly the, the, the cost to politicians of raising additional funding and raising additional revenue. So there's very limited political commitment and political investment in change. There are, of course, increasing pressures on the UK government in terms of its, the success of its overall um, deficit reduction strategy. And the more those pressures apply, the less likely it is that resources are going to be, uh, additional resources are going to be uh, made available and channeled into social care services. Um, the system, as I've already indicated, is very complex, and I think that means that ministers, and in particular the Treasury, do not understand uh, the challenges and the difficulties um, and the poor outcomes that from the current arrangements in social care. And I would also argue that the extensive marketisation of social care over the last 20 years has actually increased that complexity. It's increased the number of stakeholders, the numbers of interest groups, um, and the difficulties of lobbying together for change. Thank you. Bueno, es que ricasco, Caroline, eh, oso interés garria izan da, eta oain nahi badezue galderaren bat edo norbaitek baldin badauka berari egiteko. ¿Alguna pregunta que queráis hacer? Bai, egun hon, ez da getitzun txaliak bakin euskera. Bai, uste baiet, bai. Bueno, bi galdera motz, bi izkuntza daren gaitut. El lenguaje valderada ya personal budget programa un equin eh, administración pública que se modula o can. ¿Quién pisca de? You don't get it. No. I think maybe the channel. Diga Rena. Thank you. Bye. El lenguaje valderada es algo lista que eh, personal budget estrategia un equin. No. Eh, no. Yeah, no. Es. Sorry. Es. Diga Rena, bye. Pero no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oi, personal budget estrategia honekin, eh, administrazio publikoak ze modu daukan kontrolatzeko erabiltzaile ematen zaion diru hori 
benetan gizarte zerbitzu batzuk kontratatzera bideratzen dela, hori izango zan lehenengo aldera. Eta bigarrena, atzore zerbait e, galetu zitzaion zentzunetan Taylor Gobiri eta galetu nahi nunea merkatuak irikitze honek, ze puntura arte lagundu duen e, osa, enpresa pribatuak gehi osartzera edo sortu duen modua irabazi asmori gabeko erakundeak gehi agosartzeko e, provisio betan. Ez dakit, erderaz, decía que, bueno, dos preguntas cortitas. La primera es si esta estrategia de personal budget en qué, en qué manera ha podido ser controlada por la administración pública para garantizar que ese dinero ha sido destinado a, a gastos en servicios sociales. Y la segunda pregunta, a ver si la introducción de los mercados ha dado pie a que entidades del tercer sector ganen, digamos, cuotas de mercado en este tipo de, de servicios. Ok. Each individual, the, the total allocation, the total amount of money to each individual is controlled. Um, and there is, within that, each individual will be asked to produce a plan for how they plan to spend the money. And they will also be asked to provide evidence of how that money has been spent. Quite often people are asked to in, um, open a, a, a special bank account that the money will be paid into and they will then be able to produce statements from that bank account of how the money has been spent. So, for example, um, the money will go out um, as wages for um, helpers, um, tax, national insurance contributions for any person who's employed. So th there are controls through the local authority for uh, making sure that the money has been spent on social care related topics items. Uh, I think sometimes local authorities exercise far too much control and don't allow people flexibility um, to perhaps use the money in less conventional ways, but, but there are controls there. Um, the second point about the development of the market, the market is actually very, very diverse um, and ranges from very, very small organisations to some big multinational uh, nursing home chains. So the, at the one end the, uh, of, this, of that spectrum, the government has been putting a lot of encouragement into the development of micro enterprises. Um, so for example, groups of people who worked, women who worked as home helps for the local authority, perhaps setting up their own business, their own small business. Uh, to provide services to people with personal budgets and perhaps because they want to provide much more flexible uh, services than uh, they could when they were working for the local authority. And at the other end of the scale, and particularly in the residential sector, particularly around nursing homes, some of the major um, global um, nursing home chains. And that presents its own problems because of questions about the financial robustness of um, some of those chains. And there was a situation uh, within the last year where one of those chains actually went bankrupt um, and had to be taken over by other chains. So there's a lot of movement um, within the market, um, uh, particularly around the nursing home and residential home sector um, with these very big global organizations. So it's a very diverse and fragmented market. Usted ha aludido eh, repetidamente a las personas mayores que no ha tenido. Usted ha aludido repetidamente a que con las personas mayores los, el, los fondos económicos que se han aplicado a los servicios sociales no han tenido éxito y que tienen medio, eh, miedo a la gestión. Yo quiero hacerle con, a ese respecto varias preguntas. ¿Ese sistema no está cronificando los subsidios? Es decir, estamos buscando 
es una manera de subsidiación ajena, digamos, a la prestación de servicios. Segundo, eh, usted ha hablado de un mercado de, de cuidadores y yo pregunto quién controla eso, porque ha reconocido usted que a, a veces el dinero se dedica a cuidados de animales domésticos y a compras. ¿eh? ¿Quién controla, diríamos, los fondos? Eh, esto se parece mucho al sistema de ayuda familiar en el programa de dependencia español. Lo que no he oído hablar en ningún momento es qué conexión tiene esto con los cuidados familiares. Esos cuidados familiares, cuando existen en las personas mayores, son también ayudados con, con fondos económicos? Esa es la pregunta. Okay. All right. It is particularly common for older people to take that option there. So they will be allocated a budget, but they will say to the local authority, please manage my budget for me. Or the local, there will be a discussion. And sometimes perhaps the, the, the um, care manager will make the assumption that the older person does not want to manage the budget. And particularly thinking about the crises, the health problems, the <coughs> cognitive impairments that many older people will have, um, that is a reasonable assumption. Um, so the majority of older people who have a personal budget will have that, will, that will be managed by the local authority. And we are currently actually doing some research looking at how local authorities use that money Um, and the extent to which they do use it to, in different ways from the previous sort of bulk purchase of services. Um, we're finding some changes, some differences, but not a lot. So some of the um, problems about uh, the, the, well, the, the, the poor outcomes for older people are related to the fact that, quite simply, the processes for allocating services to them, even though they have a personal budget, uh, the processes for allocating services to them are not that different from um, traditional uh, previous practice. Um, the point about family care is a very important one, and I think given the increasing... Um, the increasingly high thresholds of eligibility for social care services, families are being relied on more and more and more. And certainly when assessing eligibility for uh, local authorities funded care, any care that's given by a family member will be taken into account and that will be discounted. So uh, if somebody says, well, I need help getting out of bed and getting dressed every day, but my daughter provides that, then that is not taken into account in, in an assessment. Um, carers are, uh, can receive support. Um, local authorities also have a, an obligation to assess the needs of carers and provide them with some support. That generally tends to be um, help to take a break, uh, to have a break, uh, perhaps a regular, you know, a night a week off or perhaps two weeks a year break. It's not an entitlement. It's not an entitlement like the uh, entitlements that carers in Germany have uh, when a relative takes the cash uh, allowance and long-term care insurance. And some interesting contrast there because carers in Germany uh, do have entitlements. Um, carers can also receive um, a social security benefit if they have no, virtually no paid work. So it, to replace incomes that, uh, an income that they lost because they had to give up work to care. Um, but in general, again, it's a sort of patchwork of support and it's certainly not comprehensive and many carers will feel that it is not adequate to the very substantial responsibilities that they carry. Preguntas también. Eh, la primera, que creo que tiene que ver con lo que preguntaba Chema eh, en alguna medida, 
Eh, por un lado, creo que cuando se analizan las prestaciones económicas que están eh, promoviéndose en muchísimos países eh, europeos eh, para la adquisición de servicios o de atención, eh, una de las cuestiones que se plantea y que se están planteando esos países es cómo se eh, evalúa la calidad de la atención prestada al margen del nivel de satisfacción que se pueda eh, eh, considerar cuando se hacen encuestas a las personas usuarias, en realidad, cómo se evalúa o cómo se controla la calidad de la atención. Eso por un lado. Y por otro lado, sí nos interesaría saber eh, eh, en el conjunto eh, de los fondos económicos individuales que se están eh, eh, concediendo en, en Inglaterra a las personas que tienen derecho de acceso eh, a dichos fondos, en qué medida las personas que lo reciben optan eh, por la contratación de servicios formales. Es decir, una vez que reciben el fondo económico, ¿en qué medida optan por la contratación de servicios formales u optan eh, por la contratación de, o bien de un familiar o de un trabajador autónomo, o, en fin, por fórmulas alternativas a los sistemas eh, convencionales? Gracias. Thank you. In terms of quality, it's not an area I know a great deal about, but um, I would say it's very poor. The quality control is poor. Um, there are user satisfaction surveys carried out uh, regularly uh, with, by each local authority, but older people in particular tend to uh, express very high levels of satisfaction, even though services may not be um, uh, adequate. Um, and there is a national regulatory body, the Care Quality Commission, which is supposed to um, inspect. Uh, all providers need to be re registered with the Care Quality Commission, um, and it is supposed to carry out regular inspections of quality, including looking at documentation, um, procedures, written procedures within each service provider, and talk to samples of service users. Um, I think the best illustration of how the Care Quality Commission does not, is not able to provide adequate quality control. Um, the best example of that is a big scandal that took place, uh, was, was revealed last year, um, with um, some people with severe learning disabilities in a home who were quite systematically being abused. And the, although people in the home had complained about it, uh, other staff had, had, had complained about it, um, it only really became public when a television reporter got a job, worked in the home, as an, an, and worked undercover as a care assistant in the home and, was, and filmed it. Um, and so I think that, yes, there is a... Um, a sort of a regulatory body, quality assurance body, but I think that's a very good example of how it's uh, not necessarily effective. And it has huge responsibilities. It has responsibilities for uh, quality control in hospitals, in the acute sector, um, in primary medical care, dentist, dentistry, mental health services, and social care. And again, it's had its budget cut. Um, so, you know, real shortcomings there. Interesting question about how far people use their personal budgets to buy formal services or to employ um, people on a freelance basis or pay, even just make ad hoc payments to friends and relatives. And for example, I know a lot of old people would want to give a relative money for the petrol. They, you know, if they took them out shopping and, or took them out in the car. Um, and the answer is I don't know. I think it probably varies considerably by um, service user group. I would suspect that younger disabled people who would be more likely, working age people, would be more likely to take the cash direct payment option and perhaps um, pay relatives or friends or have a formal employment relationship with a personal assistant. Um, older people um, would be much more likely, I suspect, to use the money to purchase formal services whether they do that through a personal contract with a service provider or whether, again, it goes back to the local authority, uh, is managed by the local authority to purchase formal services. So 
certainly if the local if if there's that if the local authority is managing the money um, on the person's behalf, they will that money will be used to purchase formal services. It won't be used the local authority won't use it to help somebody employ a employ a, a freelance person assistant.